Hi everyone, my name's Hannah, and today we're going to be talking about the evolution of hearing in Nidaria and the impact of anthropogenic noise pollution. First, we'll be talking about reasons to study ocean soundscapes. Next, we're going to cover hearing in Nidarians and negative impacts that certain frequencies can have on Nidarians. Then we're going to talk about repair proteins and discuss if Nidarians can help humans cure deafness. Next, we're going to talk about the changing ocean soundscape and anthropogenic climate change. And finally, we'll conclude with the key takeaways. Action! Humans have had profound negative impacts on ocean life since the Industrial Revolution. One source of pollution that is often overlooked is noise pollution, even though sound travels faster and further underwater than above. The marine soundscape is unique, and organisms from invertebrates to fishes to marine mammals all use sound to interact with each other and navigate their environments. Sources of sound include biophony, which are sounds of biological origin, geophony, which are abiotic natural sounds, and anthrophony, which are sounds produced by human activity, the latter of which has increased immensely over the last century. A soundscape is defined as all the sounds within a landscape over space and time, reflecting an ecosystem and the processes and life within it. Let's listen to this soundscape over here. Do you hear that helicopter? To understand how marine animals perceive and react to sound, biologists should attempt to understand the evolution of hearing in the animal kingdom. Thus far, the literature on the evolution of hearing has focused mostly on marine mammals. To have a more nuanced view of hearing evolution, the focus of my discussion will be on acoustic perception in an early clade of invertebrates, cnidarians, and how anthropogenic noise pollution may affect them. Sound quickly covers a space broader than that which any chemical or light signal can reach. Due to this, marine invertebrates evolved a number of different receptors to detect sound. The definition of sound production is generally agreed upon among scientists and audiologists. However, what it means to hear can be defined in a couple different ways. For the purposes of my presentation, hearing is the perception of sound waves in the form of a nerve signal, which is interpreted and reacted to. Cnidarians do not have a separate hearing organ. However, they possess specialized hair cells made of actin-based stereocilia that can receive mechanical sound waves and convert them into electrical signals to send throughout the body. Similar to vertebrate ears, which use sensory hair cells to hear, which you can see in this drawing I've done of the human hair cell. One research group dates the evolution of hair cells back 430 million years, suggesting it first evolved in Nathostomata, an early vertebrate group, although new evidence suggests otherwise. I hypothesize that hearing evolved first in invertebrates. In a study on two Scyphozoan medusa species, researchers documented the substantial impact sound exposure has on cnidarians. They exposed Codilorhiza tuberculata and Rhizostoma pomo to a low frequency soundscape. And then scanning electron microscopy showed injured status sensory epithelium in both species after this exposure. This observation is consistent with acoustic trauma found in both marine and terrestrial vertebrate species. This sheds light on the potential harm of noise pollution on an integral clade of marine invertebrates. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Alberta, uh, uh, Richard Palmer. I've worked as a marine biologist in, at the Banfield Marine Sciences Center since 1980, so for my, almost my entire career, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know enough about I don't know enough about the mechanics of of hearing, but the fact that mm -hmm. they respond to these behaviors at a distance suggests to me that they can actually hear them or or at least feel them in a way that they can respond to them. Corals, which are another type of cnidarian and a keystone species in coral reefs, use sound as early as the larval stage as a sediment cue. If a microscopic larva without a hearing organ is capable of this, it's possible that coral continue to use sound to perceive their environment through adulthood, although further study is needed to confirm this. 
Earlier research found that anemones were able to use hair bundles to detect vibrations produced by swimming prey. This stimulated the cnidocytes to discharge in response. This fits my earlier definition of hearing, a change in behavior as a result of a receptor receiving and interpreting sound waves. Sole et al. suggests that the first animals that evolved the ability to use sound to locate prey were coelenterates, cnidarians, and tenophores, which is a taxa that plays an important role in marine food chains. Both have sensory organs that can detect vibrations in the water to locate prey. Whether this is considered hearing, though, is contentious. Unlike tenophores, cnidarians have specialized hair cells on their tentacles that act as mechanoreceptors to inform the animal of their changing environments. Like I mentioned before, unlike tenophores, cnidarians have specialized hair cells on their tentacles that act as mechanoreceptors to inform the animal of their changing environment. Hi, my name is Jo. I am a first year master's student at UBC and I study in the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. And I am Meredith. I'm in my final year of an undergraduate in biology at Simon Fraser University. Um, so we did a short four month study on Anthopleura xanthogramica, which is the giant green anemone. We were looking at how climate warming and short term marine heat waves uh, will affect the behavior and symbiotic relationship of the anemone with its algal symbionts. Um, yeah, so basically great news was that we didn't find that they bleached. So we found that with response to heat, so as the water was getting warmer and warmer and warmer, all the anemones would close up fully and form like a little tight ball. But I know it usually when the fish touched a portion of their tentacle or a column um, wherever it landed, that they would then react. But I think it is possible that they could sense the food with either like smell, hearing, or, you know, in the broad sense um, before it reached their physical like tissue. When exposed to harmful sound, hair cells were damaged, excreted, bent, flaccid, or missing kinocilia or stereocilia. The hairs were also covered in holes or bubbles and lesions in the sensory epithelia. When anemone hair cells are damaged like this, they're able to secrete repair proteins that can fix the damaged hair cells quickly, within hours or sometimes even within minutes when extra repair proteins and ATP are administered. Not only is there proof of cnidarians hearing by our broad definition, the repair proteins found in their sensory hair cells have been found to repair damaged hearing in mammals. Due to findings from previous studies on hearing repair in blind cave fish, a research group tested how repair proteins could be used in mammals. They found that in enriched RP media, the cochlear hair cells of rats were recovered to functional health very similar to that of the control, which in my opinion is absolutely wild. Hair bundles of anemones and vertebrates bear a lot of significant similarities, including the bundles consisting of stereocilia made of actin filaments. Additionally, in both vertebrate and anemone hair bundles, cadherin-23 containing tip links interconnect shorter stereocilia to taller ones and are necessary for mechanotransduction of sound signals. The parallels between invertebrate and vertebrate hair bundles lend weight to the hypothesis that hearing using hair cells first evolved in cnidaria. Just as we're beginning to understand complex mechanisms of hearing in marine invertebrates, the ocean soundscape is changing. This is due in part to the increase of anthropogenic noise from infrastructure, ships, active sonar, etc. As well as anthropogenic climate change, which brings about changes in weathers, storm, ocean currents, sea surface ice, and iceberg calving. Biophonic sounds have also decreased due to species loss. Sounds like the hum male toadfish use to attract mates or the sounds fish schools use to congregate and coordinate spawning. We have lost many vocalizing marine mammals that use sound to navigate, mate, echolocate, and communicate with their young. The loud trills of bearded seals that make up much of the soundscape in the Arctic, the stridulation of crabs they hunt for food, and the low-frequency mating calls of baleen whales that travel across ocean basins are all parts of the ocean soundscape. Animals make mechanical sounds as well, 
For example, sea urchins make crunching sounds as they forage. Snapping shrimp make a loud noise from snapping their claws to stun prey. And even algae make sounds when oxygen bubbles accumulate, travel up the water column, and pop. So things like snapping shrimp, which make massive sounds when they close their claws very quickly. There's a suspicion that they actually sig signal to other shrimp in the area that this is where I am, this is my territory, stay out. So it might affect the behavior of, uh, of other shrimps in the area. Species loss or changes in population number has a great impact on the ocean soundscape. Soundscape ecology attempts to identify the activity and health of marine habitats by assessing and studying their soundscapes. Studying ocean soundscapes is important for understanding and preserving ocean life, given the rapid ecosystem destruction happening globally due to human activity and noise pollution. In my discussion of the evolution of hearing in animals, it was found that a clade nested deep within the metazoan phylogenetic tree, Cnidaria, exhibits hearing ability. As such, I hypothesize that Cnidarians were the first animal to develop hearing, and as such, they exhibit sensitivities to anthropogenic noise pollution. Perhaps studying hearing in earlier animal clades can help us become better listeners. I'm no longer skeptical using your definition. You've defined it in a way that, that yeah, these low frequency sounds. I guess for me, I, I'm sort of more comfortable with the notion that hearing is a kind of communication between creatures for some purpose. You certainly changed my thinking about synemones. I never thought about them, as I said, hearing in the sense that I normally think of. But mm. And I had actually forgotten that they can respond to vibrations in the water. I usually thought it was a physical contact that was required to initiate a response. So, yeah, so I learned, I learned something useful from that.